like uh, like Michael did last week, I, I, I took the slides from the last cohort from as me and uh, I tried to add some some things that I found relevant from the from reading the chapters on the book. Um, so today we are oh I can, I can start it's is everybody ready okay yeah we are we are going to talk about system setup package structure and state and it's really important in, in the first uh, in the beginning of starting the package development journey to have your system set up in a way that you can um, build build software that other persons can use and even your future self would find it useful so the um, this chapter starts with the uh, talking about R itself and R Studio, R Studio as a, a development environment for package development, and uh, um, and Hadley in the book he, talk, he talks a lot about using the all, when you are developing you should use the latest version version possible of the at least of R and and uh, and R Studio. Uh, when using R Studio, you should use the even the preview version, the because it would have the latest uh, improvements and and actually every version, at least the latest versions, they always improve improve the the build and documentation buttons and workflows inside um, R Studio. So it's usually and actually. They re release the preview version really earlier than the than the final version. So um, that that is not so long that the version one point four was released. But um, before releasing the version one point four, it was already on the preview months earlier. And it, so it, it's useful to have the the the, the development version of R Studio. Actually, R Studio also have a a daily build. Uh, R Studio itself is a, an open source project, and they they update the the their Studio every day. So if, if you go to the daily page of the of R Studio, you you see um, almost every day they have a new version. But that version is not stable enough to to be a daily build. So they recommend using the the beta that that's found on the on the preview. That, that you can find here. You see that it's also the version 1.4 now, but when they are, they will be preparing to release the 1.5, it will be already here months before. And, um, and also they talk about a, a lot about the package that, that you use to build tests or to build packages, and especially DevTools. DevTools is the most important um, Project in the in the modern R R that is focused on package building and and also uh, Oxygen Oxygen Two is the package that uh, is used to document. Um, it, it actually can be used to document a lot of uh, different files and infrastructure in R, but especially when documenting um, packages and functions. It gets everything really automated. Test that is, is important to create unit tests to the to specific parts of your code. Um, Niter is useful to building documentation also, and use this like a, a, as May uh, added this in the presentation. But she talk, she, she she said that it's actually the most important package for interactive usage in the book uh, use this is not in the this that's one by but actually use this came from a spin off of dev tools so it's also included here um and especially dev tools dev tools was a really large project uh, it started in 2000 and uh, 2011 um and in 2018, it was so big that they decided to, to do what they call it, the, the tight team 
called it the Councils and Copeland. They separated dev tools in in seven. In, in the book, it, it Hadley says that it's seven packs, but actually, if you go to the dev tools repository, there, there are at least nine other packages that took small parts of of the the dev tools. Um, but but they really tried to even even separating all these small parts of dev tools in in other packages. Um, they still try to get the main functionality that, that you can call it from DevTools itself. So um, it was a software, software engineering strategy to, to, to minimize the, the burden of maintaining the whole package together. So if you see, especially if you read the, the first version of the R package book, uh, everything will be based on DevTools. You, uh, Hadley, we always say about DevTools. If you read uh, tutorials and content about packaging development that was published between 2011 and 2017, and uh, you see that they always tell about DevTools when, when saying about functions to create the package, to document the package, to load the package, to build the package. But now they are separated in, in other packages. Uh, here you have the example of the package load. It has this function uh, load all. That this function, for example, it um, it loads all the functions that that you are developing on your package in, in your environment, so you can use it. You so you can out complete it in your in your studio. Um, um, but it's now now inside this package package load. But actually, if you if you load our studio, oh, dev tools, you can also call this function load all. Um, it's important to understand that separation, especially if you want to to use some parts of the some functions of the dev tools package inside another package that you are developing. It's better to to know the specific package where it came from. So you can have a smaller dependence inside your package than, than having the dev tools inside, uh, as a dependence to your package. But if you are using in an interactive way, you can just call library dev tools and it will be okay to, to, to call almost all of the dev, of the old old school dev tools functionality. <laughs> um, actually, our studio comes already with a Key binding, for example, for this low jaw, it's uh, control, sh control shift L or command shift L if you're using Mac. Uh, if, it, if it's not configured by default on your R Studio, it maybe could be conflicting with something in your operational system. It's, it's a good idea, idea to have uh, keyboard shortcuts for a lot of the most common DevTools um, function. Also, uh, some of the of the dev tools, the most important functionality of dev tools is also already built on the R Studio IDE. If you go to the, I can, Um, it's too small, it's too big, it's okay to, to see it here. If you, and especially the, in, in my ID, oh, it's not a package. For example, if I have a, a package repository, uh, our uh, um, studio project that is used, it was created um, for package development. It has this build, a tab, panel. And uh, uh, when you have uh, these buttons, for example, check, um, test package, build package, mo most of them call some functionality that that is also that is actually uh, using dev tools for example if you see this load all it's also it's actually the dev tools load all function function and it loads all the 
the function is my package. So just to give an example. Okay. Um, the, um, the chapter three also talks about um, and the, the, the operational system specific uh, development tools. On Linux, most of the time, you already have most of the development tools installed in your, in your environment. That is the compilers actually R depends on the, um, if you are building R itself from source, it depends on the C compiler and Fortran compiler. Um, but also if you are building packages from source, you need to have the, um, um, it's sometimes C compiler. And for the, the Windows installation, our, our installation on Windows and on Mac, it, it doesn't come with any um, the development tools. You need to install the, the tools from the system. For example, uh, for Mac, uh, you have to install the, it exactly stated on the, on the on the chapter itself for Mac, you have to use the. For example, you, you can install the Xcode. Uh, tools and it will already install for you compilers, Git. Actually, Mac don't come with Git installed, so you can use Git, GitHub, and all that. On Windows, you have to to download a specific tool, that is this R tools. It's maintained by the R core team, and it's used. Uh, it, it, when, when you install these R tools, it will install some some of those development tools that the the tool chain uses to build packages from source on your um, installation. It's and it's good to remember that they actually release specific R tools for specific versions of R. For example, you have here the R tools 4 that you can download for Windows 64 or 32, but 32 bits. But if you are using R3 point something, you have to download the more specific tools. You can find installation here. Actually on, on dev tools, you have a function that uh, that checks if you have the no wait install the uh, you you have this install dev depths that it tries to install some of the development tools if you don't don't have installed um, and we you also have the the dev tools sit no. uh, Dev CTRAP is the, this function dev CTRAP. It, it tells if your system have all the build capabilities to, to build. Everything. Oh, it's trying to, no, it, it don't want to, it's the zero. So it, say, it says, oh, I'm using, actually, I'm not using the latest version. The latest version is already. 4.0.4, it says to me, you, you are using an outdated version. You have the 4.0.4 already. It says my RStudio version, says my DevTools version. Um, it, it, uh, it's, it's pointing to outdated DevTools dependencies. I should actually, before trying to build a package that I, I'm, go, uh, I'm possibly going to release, it's better for me to update those packages before trying to test and build the, and it's also testing, and when you use this function inside a, an Arrow Studio project, there is a package, uh, it, it also checks for dependencies of, of the package that I'm developing, for example. And uh, it actually points about the, the other function that I that showed the install dev, dev depths that would do all of that automa automatically. <laughs> um, okay. Um, that's most of the of the third 
the third chapter. It's it's the the, the main take home message of this chapter is to really um, try to understand if you're understand um, what are the the development to chain and if your system is capable of building those 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 if you have the, the all the tools that the tools that's necessary to build the, the package. And the package form it's focused on the on the structure, the I could say the the file structure, the file system structure used during the development and during all the stages of the uh, of the package life cycle. Because when you are developing a package on your own system, you have a structure that it's just a, a bunch of files. Actually, for a package, the only thing that's really necessary is a description file that states the what your package does and who and who, who wrote things like that and then a folder with a lot of functions inside them um, if you have this it's it could be already a package it's, it's already um, have all the functionalities but when it's installed in your system it, um, it can be installed in different in different ways and actually in your file system, the, the installed package don't have this structure. It's converted to binary form, and then um, the folder structure changes. And chapter four talks exactly about um, how how is that structure. So, um, if um, the the first um, stage, you know, the first build, actually, I. I needed a picture here that it could, it was not built. Okay, that's okay. Um, um, actually, if you are using Linux system uh, on Linux, are always try to build packages from source um, when when you are installing packages. It will download the code itself and and build every function transform it into a binary format and then load it in your system. But actually on Windows and on Mac, the CRAN already builds compiled versions. So when you install a package on, on Windows and, and Mac, it's already in this binary format. Um, but if you want to build a package from source now on your own machine, you have to you need to have the compiler and the command line tools that we talked earlier, then that, that that was talked in the the on the third chapter, and these in the the five stages are those the source state, that is this um, just your um, code files and your um, build files, your the files that are is used during your development on a single directory. This is your source state. That is the bundle state stage. That is um, the, the bundle state is, uh, is is actually just the source state and compressed in a single file, so so it can be distributed. Distributed you when you bundle your package in a in a, in a compressed file like a, a zip file. Actually, it's a tar a tar dot gz file. Uh, you can send it to another person, and that person would, would would be able to install. Actually, you can send it to Chrome, so Chrome can can upload it when it's in this in this state. Because actually, if you just copy your directory and try to give it to someone that's using another operational system, some, some things could could change. Like it, uh, Mac could not recognize sometimes. The way the files are, uh, are created in Windows, but when you you try to install in the bundle state, it would be um, platform agnostic and transportation friendly. And uh, but uh, you can also create a binary, and that that bundle state is created by the DevTools build tool, or the this build command on the 
here you can on the R Studio build pane you have the build source package here. Down here is also the build binary package. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. And the binary package is the is actually the 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 format that your system needs to to a package to be installed, but it's actually platform specific. So if you build a binary format that's go, that supposed to work on Windows 64 bits, it will just work on a Windows 64 bits and even could be incompatible um, with another Windows if it, it don't have the exactly same dependencies of when the, the, the binary was created. So it's, it's actually the easiest to, um, it's the format that it's already ready to be to be used, but it's platform specific. So um, on the chapter, he says about it being binary format is used on Windows and Mac OS, like I said, but recently um, the R Studio package manager started to provide some binary build package for Linux also. So that there are some ways to acquire binary packages to to Linux distributions also. Okay. Um, and, and I have a quick question. Okay, yeah, you can interrupt me in time. I sometimes speak some uh, kind of fast, so you can just interrupt me if you have any doubt or if I'm speaking too fast. Yeah. So, so the binary, the binary, um, you say is platform specific. It means. Uh, when we build a package at the binary stage um, is platform specific, right? It yes. cannot, um, if I build it on Mac. So um, what stage, um, when we build it, that is when it becomes platform independent, right? When you bundle, when you bundle it. Bundle, it, yes. You, it's, plat it's this second state here, it's the, it's the state that you can distribute to any platform, but actually, for example, you can build a binary for for Windows on your Mac, for example, but um, it will be a different file than, than the one built for Mac. I don't, I don't know if it's clear. Uh, from the bundle, yeah, okay. yeah. bundle state, you could build a lot of binaries for different distributions. You could build a binary for Windows, a binary for Linux, a binary for... Mac and a binary for Solaris that is also a platform that current supports. But you you would need some development tools specific for each of those of those platforms. It's clear. Yeah, I think yeah, um, to add, I think in the book um, it said that the extension or of uh, the name extension of the files for each platform is also different. I yes. think in Windows it's .zip and in uh, Mac OS I think it's .tgz if I'm not mistaken. So, well, yes, of exactly course that. I would we would I wouldn't be able to identify whether it's um, a Mac OS or Windows binary while looking at its contents. I mean, um, it's binary. Actually, when you go to the Chrome page for a package, for example, if you open the okay, oh, it's not the for example um, Dev Tools Chrome. If you go to the to the package to the to the page of a package in the um, on the current repository, actually here on the downloads you can see that you have the package source. That is what I say. When it's in this tar.gz, it's actually the bundled state. If you uncompress this this file, you, you are going to see exactly the the file system structure, the folder, the R folder, the test folder with all the files inside. But if you see here, you can see the, the binaries that we are talking about. Um, mm. you, have like, you have, for example, specific binaries for Windows, for R 3.0.3, or for, for, for R 4.0.4. So those this binary format is really specific for a, uh, operational system and and actually here you can see that's also specific for a a version of R. So yeah, in in the like you said the like Mike Michael said it's it changed the the format that 
Cran uses for that. Um, yeah, and um, where again? Okay, here. So and we we submit the bundle. We submit the bundle version to Cran, right? Um, I, actually, I never submitted to Cran, but uh, what I uh, what I understand it's it's that it's the bundled format that that's to be meted and actually cron builds the the binaries to be distributed for example probably when they submitted this this file to cron and and the machines that cron use they have an automated system that builds all all those orders but actually for you to to know if your package works and and if your package works on on those other platforms you need to have some some way you, you need to have some infrastructure to test that or you, you should ask for a friend to install or something like that or use some automated tools some continuous integration continuous development tools that can actually we are going to to see some of those on the chapter seven but uh, there are some ways for you to test this infrastructure without needing another computer or, or using the cloud but uh, it's actually the bundle state that that is what's submitted but you need to understand if your binaries would work because if it don't work um if your if you from your bundled state you can only build a binary that will work only on mac cron will not accept that you you need to to have a, a package that is capable of 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 being built for another system Okay, so okay, yeah. if I understand right, um, we submit the bundle version to CRAN and the CRAN will um, build it to binary version that allows other people to download and install it based on their system specification, right? Yes. Yeah, when you, you, uh, you are in your R and you, you, type, and you um, type the command install package de dev tools, it will download the if, if you are using Windows or Mac, if it will download the specific, it will identify your system and download the specific binary for your for your system. If you are using Linux, it will build it from the source actually. Um, unless you are using another repository that's not the default program. It's clear. Yes. Okay. And um, and from the actually the binary is this compressed folder that is used to install, and then your package goes to the installed to install uh, state. It's when this 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 binary um, package goes to a specific folder on your system that your R installation can can actually that can can read from it and. And load the the functions from that. Actually, when when it's in this installed uh, state, it resembles the structure of a package, but with completely different different um, files and file structure. You will not see an a script there. You want to see see a um, a binary. Um, our data file that from this our data you can load functions um, and and the, there is a, a fifth state that is when you load and um, actually in the book they they when it's in the installed uh, in state you stop calling it a package and start calling it a library. It's the, the moment when it becomes a library and not just a package. Uh, it's not just a lot of uh, scripts it's packaged, it's, it becomes a library on your system. And when you use the library function or require or other functions that load, load parts of a package in your system, it's, it's going to be loaded in your memory and it's, it's called this in memory state. It's when you uh, it's you have uh, access to an environment where the pack, the functions from a package is loaded in your memory. Um, yeah, here was supposed to to be a. To let me 
it, it's actually on the book. Let me, oh, I close the book. All right, the case. There. Yeah, because um, with, with the this, for example, when you are building a package, there are some files that that you need to have. For example, this is this description file, the namespace file that that says I have a question. what are, what is each function, and there are like documentation and your R R scripts with function inside it, and when you convert from a format to the other, it actually changes some of the structure. That's what this figure shows. But actually, this other function is, is oh, so this other, um, okay. um, yeah, okay. And it will not load the um, you. Here is a diagram of how it's converted from one state to the other. That is what, what we, we were talking about. Here. When you install a package directly from CRAN using the install package, it actually acquired directly from CRAN the binaries and install it on your system using what's a command line tool. And it becomes installed. And if you use a the library call, it will go to the memory state. Um, if you are installing from a GitHub repo, for example, you use like the dev, dev tools, install GitHub, and it will download the source code from GitHub, transform it in, a, in the bundle state. Then from the bundle, it will be transformed in, in, into the binary. And from the bind, oh, actually, no, yeah. If, if you're installing from a, a bundle that is, is already on your system, it, it goes direct to the installed in state state. So, so not um, depending on the way you are installing a package, it don't need necessarily to to go to all those those steps. It could be installed directly from the source to the to, to the installed state. But actually, to for you to use a package, you need to have it installed, Hello? and then you need to Is load my it. Network? I cannot hear. Sorry. Sorry, something did you cannot hear, Lucio? Hello. Oh, seriously. Hmm? Oh, um. Yeah. Are you hearing right now? Well, I can hear both of you. Oh yeah. And so. Hello. It's clear the sound. It's okay. Uh, okay. Can you hear me, uh, Shamshuddin? Right. Now I can hear, but b before I can see mouse only moving, I cannot hear anything. Uh, okay. All right. Okay, yeah, actually, uh, I can show, for example, the. Uh, it, it will change depend on the on the operational system, but for example, on, on a Linux installation, if you have the, um, when you install a package, R creates an R folder on your home directory. I'm on my, on my own computer, on my home, and I have a, an R folder that it has a lot of, bad, bad idea. It's actually, it creates a specific folder for the installed version of uh, the package that was built for Linux, six four bits, and here that it will be um, it, it actually installs for different versions of R. And here you have a um, a folder for each package that I install. And if I go, for example, for the Dev Tools. Um, the tools package that installed in my system, I will see that we have this this structure, and it, it kind of kinds of resemble the the instruct the the structure of a, a source package. But you, when you go to the to the R folder, you you see that you um, you don't have the R file with the actually. 
um, are called, you have some binary format that is used to load the, the package, the, the, the functions in the package. And you also have some, and, and also the documentation that's built in the, in the MAN file is also converted for HTML. That is the, the actual format that that's uh, that's re that that appears on your system when you call the, um, for example, the the help functionality here in the in the studio. If I call the the for example dev tools uh, build, and I call the help functionality here, it will load this page. Um, on the, um, and, and also vnets and things like that. When you have the installed package, um, all the documentation needs converted to the, um, to, to the more, to, to the more used, to the, the format that's used by your system actually. Um, 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 and actually, it's really important uh, now. Now that we know this structure and how this structure is transported from one state to the other, it's really useful to understand how the build ignore file works. Because um, not all files that you you are using in your source code is needed on the on the on the end package. So. Um, this R build ignore file is a file that you have, you need to have on the, um, you can, you can have it on the root directory of your package and it will be used to say, oh, some, some of those files or some of those folders aren't necessary on the bundle state. So, um, um, it's useful to, to address them correctly. Because it will, uh, if if you get all your all, all your development files on your bundle state, first your package will be kind of bloated. It will be a not a lot of unnecessary files. Um, CRAN checks for that. CRAN checks if you have unused files on your bundled package. So it it, it will decrease your chances of getting your package accepted. Um, you can create this file manually. For example, I have here a build ignore file that has, it's getting slow. For example, it excludes the license uh, markdown file, the, this, this dota project file, dota project user file. There is, there are, there is a temporary directory that our studio save uh, session information, um, the data how, for example, I have here a, a Docker file that, uh, I'm, that I'm using to, during the development stage, that it, but it's not necessary for, for the R code itself. Um, and, and it uses what's called a regular expression. This regular expression says that it could be, for example, seeing any name that ends with an R dot, R pro, pro, a dot, R, Dot project file, um, and actually, as May on the on her presentation, she she pointed that for some people that is not really used with regular expressions, it could be error prone. So they use this package. Have I used build ignore function that can be used to already create those those build ignore um, regular expressions for you? Would be safest. Um, yeah, that's mostly it. Um, and actually, if if you are using the use this package for your development uh, workflow, it creates a lot of uh, unnecessary folders and files that that's not necessary to the end state of a package. But all all use this functions already add stuff to, to your, to your R build ignore. Um, so we, it's kind of safe. Everything that you add using, 
use this workflow it's it's safe to be used um yeah now it's come to the to the end of the presentation and uh, i would like to open for questions and debates and um, if you're going to go step by step on the learning objectives on the on this on these chapters <laughs> it would be good also <laughs> So in chapter three, it, it, it was really important to understand why it, it's good to use, for example, the, the preview version of Fire Studio. Um, everyone is comfortable with the, the, this, this idea of using a, a better software for development. <laughs> um, especially understand what's needed to install dev tools and the the following um, tool chain for building packages from source. That's the most useful information on, on chapter three. And on chapter four, it's oh, the, the most important thing is for you to understand the names of those of those states, especially especially like we already addressed that the bundle state is the state that you, that you that you need to, to submit to CRAM, but also you need to understand that if your binary packages are not um, able to be built, your package will not be accepted. Um, and the source state is the state that you actually are developing on your system. Um, that is useful to add RBUD ignore, uh, to add files to RBUD ignore. Um, yeah. That's mostly it. <laughs> and in this, uh, this is an important lesson. Uh, the definition between what's a library library and what's a package. The package is what, what you're developing, developing your code, your bundled states are, is also a package, but a li library is a um, computer program installed on your system, basically. That's the definition that they use. Um, Oh, actually, they, they added this. I, I, I forgot to add this. Um, sometimes it's useful to, to have um, libraries and the programs that are installed in your system as a, a whole, and the libraries that is installed just for your users, especially if you have a development environment, you sometimes could be useful to have um, Packages installed in, in another folder to be used for specific purposes or specific for testing your your package to know if your package works and you could, for example, test uh, different versions of of a package, things like that. Yeah, I think it's it's done. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Lucio. Yeah, I think it's very nice that you pointed out. Um, I think the uh, the CTRAP function of the dev tools and also check dev depths uh, because it reminded on the importance of um, keeping your packages always up to date every day. I think I saw in Twitter yesterday or two days ago on ask someone asking people how often they update their packages, and I saw the uh, I think several people. Um, so whenever they start their work, then they will always update. Uh, oh. around the update.packages, which I have, have never done actually because I update my package it, like when I'm installing a package and it told me to update it. Other than that, I've, I never manually run the update.packages. Yeah, actually uh, updating your package, uh, like for a data analyst, updating your package every day could could bring havoc to your system yes. and everything could stop. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, but exactly. A, but for a package yes. developer, is is really important to be on the on the leading edge. So you, especially, because uh, you could be developing right now something that if you update a package, it will break your your code. So. Yeah. yeah, especially I'm doing um, mostly data analysis and the data analysis can take weeks or even months. And I, I'm just feeling uncomfortable if I have to update 
uh, my packages every so often because yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. my results uh, that I did in the earlier weeks will change or I don't know. <laughs> it will. You can be sure. <laughs> I'm sure that it will. And that, yeah. that's um, and that's a lesson that you probably should look for different environments for developing your packages than the environment that you actually do your data analysis work. And there are some technologies that can enhance that. One of them is containers, uh, like Docker. I don't know if you already heard about that. You can create a, a fully separated um, install of everything on your system. So you can develop inside the, this environment and don't bug your system, things like that. It's, it's kind of useful. Um, like maybe a virtual machine or you know, something like that, or develop on the cloud. Actually, yeah. have a yeah um, a remote computer that uh, the 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 software that you are building. For example, you you can develop on a in in a version that are, are that's not updated. But when you are going to test your package, you you at least on that stage you have to test on the on the release and the development version of R. Um, we are going to talk about some of those tools on on chapters. I think it's seven in uh, from automated tests and especially when using GitHub, they they have some tools that can test automatically for you if it's working on different operational systems. And it's it's not the point of this of this this chapter. But yeah, it, it's actually really hard to have a, a development robust. Um, system that's also a stable system. <laughs> it's not easy to achieve that. Yes, I'm, I'm terrible. Actually, about um, I didn't went through the. Um, actually, they talk about using use this um, using the R profile file to add some automated um, how can say, um, to, to loading package automatically or, or loading um, some options automatically so so when you run some of the use these fun functions it's already um, it's already there like they actually uh, talk about the the um, automatically loading dev tools. If you're going to use dev tools every day, or you have the your system on dev tools, you should uh, add, for example, this to your R profile package, so you can every, every time your R studio loads, or even the R command line session, it will automatically load the the packages. Actually, I'm not fun of that. I, I'm I, I'm the kind of guy that likes to know what I'm loading on my system. I, I prefer to have a key binding for doing that than doing that automatically. So key binding is also something that's important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, there is a package um, that allows you to make anything into shortcuts in our studio, right? I think it's um, shortcuts. Mm -hmm. Package, already, but without all yeah, the fouls from Gatic. Yeah. Like, it's, like that, but I'm never trying. It's quite, it's quite nice actually. Yeah, actually, our studio is has a lot of reading functionality. That's actually, it, it could be kind of daunting on the first time that if you try to, to if, if you open the, the keyboard. Keyboard shortcut, the modify keyboard shortcut. It has infinite amount of options, and actually, some packages also also add. If, if you see that there is a, a package development, you, you see that a lot of functionalities don't have a default key binding, but if, if you, you can define your own workflow, but actually, all of those that are add-ins, they are added by package, so. Every package can can um, some functions inside packages can have default key bindings. Also, you can see that have some ggplot stuff and, and a lot, lot of options here. So 
actually our studio can be really customized and in in enhanced. I don't know. <laughs> I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs> yeah, and I wonder whether um, any of you have any experience. So, um, for example, if you're developing a package, and well, nowadays uh, people are working from home, and sometimes people go to their uh, office uh, once in a while. So, maybe um, one can use like two different computers or systems to develop um, a single package. But then, there's a problem, right? Because um, your um, computer at home maybe has all this set of packages with um, these versions, and then your computer at work have a different set of packages. Then how would you uh, mitigate that? I think I, uh, I think I saw people uh, using .r uh, the renv package to have this um, project specific package. But then I'm not entirely sure how to do that, like to yeah, um, the, make the, that is, your... isn't uh, an easy solution to that, but um, trying to work on the most standardized possible way is the, is the answer. Like uh, if you're going to use, use this functionality to build a, a, every step of your package, you have to use that on both machines, but also... Um, Exactly next week, we are going to talk about Git and GitHub, but on at least on GitHub, there is a lot of functionality that you can use to streamline that. If you use GitHub as your central repository for your code, it's easier to download from GitHub on every machine that you are working and, and synchronizing from there. But actually for the package versions, yeah, our range is the most used. It's not the most used, but it's the most modern workflow mm -hmm. for for package, package versions. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and yeah, yeah it's also and like a, I said, a problem maybe, that I'm still working on. Yeah, yeah, then maybe virtual machines or like cloud computing things like that also work. I actually use a lot of um, Docker containers, like I said before, um, I use that for development. Because on a, on a Docker container, you can, um, I don't know how to explain, uh, you can discriminate your system. You can explain, I need this package on that version. You can need this system, this system tool installed on, on this version, even tools that don't depend of R. So, because actually R env is to just manage the R packages. So it's, uh, it will not work in the same way if you are in another computer with other tools, other version of tools. You're stuff. right. Yeah, you're right. Um, actually, if, um, in the, in the yeah. Python community, they use a lot of Conda and um, virtual environments. A, a lot of the ideas that are in use, uses came from, from the vir Python virtual environment tools. But um, even the Python environment tools is not, it's not the, the right solution for, the, for everything. So it, it's... It, yeah. It's just not because co computers are different. Yeah, co computers. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, yeah, nice... I can totally understand your point. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go. All right. Bye, Gavin. Bye. See you next week. Bye. Yeah, I can I can totally understand your point because uh, when I first uh, moving from R to Python and I use Conda. And sometimes you can get a lot of uh, problems with your package installation, right? And I don't know, just something went wrong and you cannot use anything at all. And I think my best solution is just to uninstall and install Conda again. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, course, I also yeah. had a lot of problems with Conda. And, and I also prefer to install the, the Python library separated and, and understanding why it's functioning or not. Because actually, Especially Conda sometimes, not, not saying that it's general, it, it makes the, develop, the developers kind of lazy or they, they make that thing that will only work when you're using Conda to install it and it can't be installed on a normal system. So That's it, true. especially, you, you know, 
the the bioinformatic tools the it's really common on bioinformatic tools. yeah 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 it's 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 difficult because i, I think uh, my main problem is um with uh, using all all of this um you know synchronization things for um data analysis projects is that okay i can sync i can centralize all my data analysis scripts in github but then of course in bioinformatics analysis you have like uh, such, yeah, sometimes such a big data amount data. of data and then plots you make so many plots and you cannot save it to uh github uh with uh oh, yeah, okay. if you have don't do that <laughs> you have if you have tons of plots, no, you cannot. You will uh, use up all your quota in in yeah, in the blink of an eye, right? Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah, my, I, ha I actually worked with uh, at least like three different groups that use totally different workflows on that. Like some people like to sync on Dropbox the results while the code yeah. is on GitHub. Or, so, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I went, also went did that. Everything on Dropbox. And, and it, it gave me a headache. Yeah. Yeah. I, so sometimes you have just to follow what your co-workers do, but yeah. That's true. That is very true. Yeah. yeah. Actually, think... there are some R packages that were developed trying to, to enhance that experience. One of them is like RMV4 packages, but also there is like the PINs, PINs package that try to standardize how to get a data set, for example. Um, you can have like um, an Amazon Web Service S3 um, for, mm -hmm. your, for your how data that everyone pulls from the same, the same object, uh, object storage. Um, actually, I work in a lot of, uh, I work a lot on um, remote servers. We, we have some Rouge HPC clusters and and I need to transport my code a lot of times from my computer to this HPC environment. So th there are some tools to try to standardize the environment. Like I said, Docker containers, Linux containers, um, RNV itself, trying to make the your environment the most close possible to the environment of another computer. computer. So th there, are, there are tools that enhance that experience. But it's not yeah, easy. You, you are not never going to have exactly the same data, the same files, the same CPU yeah. that you have on your system and other. Yeah, I think I guess there's a limit to. Uh, of course, you can make everything reproducible, but then whether it's feasible or what worth the time, I'm not entirely sure. Because, yeah, um, I also have access to computer cluster, but then. Uh, well, most of the time I'm working for my uh, personal or work uh, PC. And then if uh, I have to do uh, run a big job, and then of course I will send it to the, my uh, the shock cluster. But then of course uh, my, uh, my HPC sometimes have a different version of R and, and different everything. And yeah. <laughs> if you want to make everything the same, of course you can run a container, but then for a sing for like for a tiny job and then you have to bake a container for all of those <laughs> i don't have time yeah yeah exactly hard yeah, yeah. It, it takes time yeah for, for sure if, if you want hyper, reproducibility it, it takes time it it takes a lot of yeah it, actually the, the other persons around you need to be using the same tools that's that's, that's the, true. the most hard part uh, um i receive yeah. a lot of app scripts every day on What's up on cell phone? <laughs> 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 on my Gmail account, so it, it's hard to make the people oh. around you follow some some stand, standards. Yeah, yeah. That's why creating a package for your data analysis, for example, is is the most, at least in, in the R community, it's the most streamlined way to make everyone using the same package. Even if it's your package on GitHub, if at least everyone on your team could install from the same GitHub repo, you could at least know that the people is using the same tools, even if it's going to achieve some different results depending on where they are. <laughs> you, that's true. At least that's they true. are going to be running the same code. That's yeah. That's the best <laughs> that yeah. you can do. Yeah, you're right. 
Oh well. Oh okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for yeah for your presentation, Lucio. Really having a great time chatting with you. Nice. Thank you. I had some technical issues with sharing um, slides, but <laughs> I hope next time it will be better. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's All right. Morning. Well. Okay. Well, uh, I hope you have a good week. So see you in the next session. Yeah, see you next week. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.